Gucci. We Gucci. That was my home lab. A home lab is a cute little name for a collection of servers or computers that you run yourself uh, with the intention of learning, experimenting, testing, and teaching yourself about software, hardware, and the architecture of systems. If you're watching this video, you fall into one of two categories. Um, either you know what a home lab is and you're here for the... And here we have the CCTV VLAN with... Or you're just a follower of my Errant Minds content and you just like watching me talk about interesting stuff. I think this is really interesting. I've spent the last four years of my life being clinically obsessed with this. Um, it's kind of getting a bit worrying now, but it's really enjoyable. I mean, at least I find it really enjoyable. And uh, I just wanted to make a little video about what it is, the, the, the why, the how, and the what is currently going on in my home lab slash production server setup. I spend so much time on this thing that is kind of, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like a very important part of my life. <laughs> oh my God, that's sad. So yeah, it's worth talking about because it's, I spend so much time on it that I want to have something to show and something to say, look, this is what I spend my time doing. So to reiterate, a home lab is a lab. It is an environment where you can mess around, you can mess things up, you can royally things up without it being a problem. You don't have a production workload, you don't think have things that need uptime, you don't have things that people are paying to be online and where your job is on the line. It's a place where you can create, transform and destroy at will, build out entire digital infrastructures and architectures and then wipe them in a second. It's a the ultimate sandbox for an IT professional basically. So that is half of the why. Learning, teaching yourself, experimentation. The other half of the why is a bit weirder. I'm really into data privacy and digital freedom. That's something that I am very passionate about and I believe very strongly in. So how this manifests itself in the home lab is I'm trying to migrate all my cloud services onto my local on-prem servers on the home lab. This is a double-edged sword, okay? I would not recommend that people do this. If you f up, you will lose everything. It's kind of forces myself to think about production, but it's it's my production, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't impact anyone else. If I screw up, I majorly inconvenience myself, but no one else. So for example, uh, cloud storage, like uh, Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, that's kind of thing. I'm running an open source alternative called Nextcloud, which runs exactly the same. It synchronizes your files from all your different devices. But instead of syncing them to the cloud, it syncs it to the server in my garage. I use it to run a bunch of other software as well. Um, I will go through that in the aforementioned network diagram. The data privacy thing is a whole nother kettle of fish. To use a computer is to be tracked. It's so difficult to avoid completely. However, by running the software that I do, you can at least depersonalize a lot of the information that people collect on you. What I do want to talk about is the physical hardware and the setup that I was running and the setup that I am now running. I was supposed to make this video months ago when I was still running my old setup, which was kick ass. It was, it was, it was sick, it was so good. But I've since switched things around and it's slightly different now. So I wanted to talk about the glory days and how it was when it was kind of a peak architecture. So the system that we're looking at now is as my home lab was a couple of months ago. It is three servers and they're running in a high availability cluster. This is my hyper-converged cluster. It handles software-defined storage, software-defined networking, runs all my services, and is the backbone of the operation. These stay on 24 seven and run everything. So these Proxmox servers, these Proxmox hypervisors were all connected together and they were configured for high availability. So what that looks like in practice is an entire server could fail, it could go offline. Everything that was running on that server is now offline and down and not available. Because it's configured for high availability, the cluster thinks, oh, I need to make sure that these are running. So it starts, whatever was running on that node, on that server that failed, it will just start on the other servers. And then after a couple of minutes, everything that was lost is back again. So it will automatically heal and sort itself out. Now, there's one big problem with high availability and that is storage. Storage is a big problem because whatever is running on the storage has to be directly attached to the storage. So if one of those servers goes offline, how are you gonna attach that storage to the things that you, the new versions of those services, because the storage was on the old server that's now offline, right? Aha, uh -huh. 
The solution to this is shared distributed storage. I was running Ceph because that was pretty easy to set up with Proxmox. It's got the, I can tell you it's got the best price to performance ratio because it's free and open source and it's pretty good. There are other distributed shared file systems like Weka and stuff like that, but those that's enterprise level and the license costs, I don't even want to know how much. Ceph, basically you have three servers and it mirrors the storage across the three servers. So if you save a file on one server, Ceph says got you and copies it to the other two servers. So it means you can access the files from any server. So this cluster was sick. I had a virtualized firewall and router, um, virtualized networking, I had shared storage, all this good stuff. So it meant, for example, I could do some really cool stuff. My virtualized firewall slash router, PFSense, what the high availability means is that it can be running on one server and I can move it to another server and there's no interruption. So what it will do is it will start a new virtual machine on the second server, copy the contents of the RAM across and then just start using the new one. So those were running Kubernetes nodes, they were running Docker Swarm nodes. So not only did I have high availability at the hypervisor level, but I also had high availability on the software container level. So if a node fails, instead of starting up a whole new virtual machine, which takes a little while, I can just reschedule pods on another node. To those who don't know what that is, that's gobbledygook, but it's really cool. And in one of the nodes, I even had a GPU. I had an NVIDIA Tesla P4, I think. So that was all really cool. It was a sick setup and I'm very sad that I had to migrate away from it. But the reality was, is that it was consuming an ungodly amount of power and I just wasn't using it to its full extent, to be honest. The CPU utilization of all the nodes was, was hovering, you know, below 5% most of the time. You know, it was just underused. I don't, I don't have enough stuff to run on, on all that hardware. And the problem is I don't have the supporting infrastructure. One of the main reasons I migrated away from this setup is the storage. Although I had 18 hard drives, six SSDs and, you know, 10 gigabit networking, all this stuff, I actually couldn't sustain that many hardware failures. Because the thing is, Ceph is designed to be a hyperscale file system. The way you scale it out and the way you build out redundancy and speed and storage capacity is by scaling horizontally. You don't scale vertically. Um, horizontal versus vertical scaling. Vertical scaling is when you upgrade a single machine and horizontal scaling is when you just add more machines. And the thing is with Ceph is the redundancy is node based. It's not um, drive based. It basically meant that I could only lose one drive from each node. And I knew that all my hard drives were from the same manufacturing batch. And I knew that if one failed, the likelihood of the rest failing is higher than it would be normally. That made me really nervous because it means I could only lose two drives. I could lose all the drives from one server, but only two of the drives from two servers. So although it, it was kind of very resilient, but really not resilient, it was kind of a weird, it's a weird thing. I did almost accidentally wipe the entire cluster once. Um, that was so incredibly stressful. I accidentally um, deleted the Proxmox configuration directory on one node, but because it's in cluster mode, it propagated across the whole cluster and instantly wiped everything. Um, I didn't have a backup, um, and this was when I first started using this cluster, and I really was over in, in over my head. Luckily, I was able to save it. So, okay, lesson learned. It's just not a very resilient system in the way that I had to set up. Could it be? Yes, but you need the scale. You need the scale to make it resilient. So not only do I not have the infrastructure to operate it correctly, but I don't have the infrastructure to let it be utilized to its fullest extent. So I've got all this processing power, all this speed, all this all this power, but I can't use it. My I'm on a residential connection, my upload speed is doo-doo. This cluster was so barbaric overkill, and I just couldn't use it. So what I did is I migrated from three servers to one server. Um, it's still the same hardware, it's a Dell R630, um, and now I'm running, I'm still running Proxmox, but instead of having shared Ceph storage, I'm now just running a ZFS array. So now I've got a ZFS array of SAS SSDs, enterprise grade, that handles VM storage, high IOPS stuff, anything that needs to be really fast and really low latency goes on the SSD pool. And then I've got an EMC VNX disk shelf attached to it, which is chock block full of hard drives, which is about 25 terabytes of spinning Rust storage. So that is a lot more space, but a lot slower than the SSDs. 
and I have I have a lot of faith in that hard drive port because although a mechanical hard drives are a lot more prone to failure, I've got more drives and I can have more resiliency. So what I've actually got is I've got two V devs of RAID Z2 drives. So I've got seven drives in one V dev, seven drives in the other V dev, and two drives from either of those or both of those V devs can fail, and I still have all the data and it's still up and running and safe. Okay, so let's go and have a look at the current servers. This is what the current servers are looking like. This is my little server corner in my dad's garage. This is the new slim down setup. We've got two servers here. This is the main one. This is on all the time. This is the backup one. This is the disk shelf. It's kind of a bit cramped in here. So this bottom server is the main production server. This runs everything on a daily basis, stays on all the time. Um, these drive bays are full of the SAS SSDs. That's an RAID Z2 pool. These two drives here are the mirrored Z1 boot drive uh, for Proxmox. And then the top one is the backup server. So that's full of um, 1.2 terabyte 10K SAS drives, which would not be my first choice, but I had them uh, and I had a lot of them, which means that I could just stuff this thing full of them and get about seven, about seven terabytes. So that allows me to back up um, all my essential data on a daily basis. There is a significant amount of data on this disk, on this disk shelf, <laughs> on this disk shelf um, that I can't back up. Uh, just because you know this is this is 25 terabytes, and it's not stuff that I would really miss if it were to go missing. Uh, it's you know Steam games, it's Linux ISOs, it's you know big big stuff that is not really that important. All the important stuff I is backed up on a regular basis and is really nice and safe. Networking, um, I don't know if you can see me. The main server is networked at 10 gigabit. It's got two uh, uplinks and they're trunked together in LACP. Um, so I've got redundancy and throughput there. Um, the third, this third little 10 gigabit is for the backup server, which just means that I can back up things a little bit faster. Um, everything else is one gig. I plan to upgrade at some point to 2.5 gig and I wanna expand the 10 gigs throughout the house. So many blinky lights. I love blinky lights. I swear half the reason I do this is to see those lights blink. Oh my God. So this still uses a lot of power. It's not power efficient in the slightest. However, it's great bang for buck. If you were to rent the same hardware on the cloud, it would cost you thousands a month. Plus this server is chock-a-block full of interesting hardware. It's got an, an Intel Optane drive for ZFS caching. It's still got that NVIDIA P4, which I use for video transcoding and uh, running Olama, like local LLMs. 256 gig RAM, 24 cores. It's, it's, it's hefty enough for everything that I need to do. And obviously I have, I've had to slim down my Kubernetes cluster. I'm now running K3s just with a single node. It matches, it meets my requirements and it's lean and mean. It's much safer, it's much more secure. I now have other servers. I've now got those other two servers that I was using in the cluster and I can now back up to that. So I've got daily backups. So what you saw me doing at the beginning of this video was installing some RAM in the second server, uh, which is now my daily backup server. So every night it will power on automatically, make a backup of everything on my running cluster and then turn off again. And then I'm planning to use that third server that was in my cluster just for experimentation or if I've got a hardware failure, or I need some extra processing power, or I want to do some upgrades but need to keep my core services running, I can offload them to that spare server. It's just really useful. From past experience, I've been doing this for four years now, and having spare hardware that you can move everything to, fiddle around, move everything back, is so helpful. I babbled a lot near the end there, so I'm sorry for that, but I hope it was interesting. If you got this far, um, you must be interested. So now we're gonna move on to the network diagram and what I had running on my high availability three node cluster. I did make a little quick network diagram when I was actually supposed to do this video originally, so we'll run through that quickly now. I can't imagine it's got any information in it that is useful at this point or interesting because I've been talking for like 15 minutes. However, let's whiz through it. This is the entire network stack as it was when I had this cluster up and running. Um, there's not much to it, to be honest. Over here, we've got the Oniroi cluster, which uh, <laughs> if you didn't think this was nerdy and sad enough, um, I named all my servers. <laughs> um, they're called Morpheus, Fantasis, and Phobator, who are the sons of Hypnos in Greek mythology. And I thought I chose that because, I can't believe I'm saying this, I, I chose that because um, 
All the VMs, they don't know that they're VMs. It's like they're sleeping, you know? They're in a dream. Unsurprisingly, I'm wet for the Matrix, which is why also I have um, two of my backup servers called Tank and Dozer and my off-site backup is called Cypher, which are all characters from the Nebuchadnezzar in the Matrix. Anyway, sad things aside, we've got a bunch of stuff running on this cluster. PFSense, that is the router slash firewall. Postal is an SMTP delivery system designed for um, server applications. I did have a Docker Swarm set up. That was my first production deployment environment, uh, but I'm not using Docker Swarm anymore because I just, I was having problems with it. I just didn't like it that much. Production K3s, that's where all my production deployments go. Anything that people are paying for or that I really must make sure stays up all the time, that goes on K3s. This K3s cluster was awesome. Um, it was linked in into the Ceph storage that was running on the Proxmox host nodes, um, which meant that it could have dynamically provisioned and shared Ceph storage for the pods. Uh, MailCow, that is a self-hosted email server, so just like Gmail. Windows 10 Sandbox, that's just a throwaway Windows 10 machine. HA Proxy, that is the main ingress point for all my services, at least coming from the internal and home networks. As I said, we've got some backups here. We've got Tank and Dozer. One of them did Proxmox backups and the other did file system backups for everything that I had on CephFS. All these are uh, near right I've networked at 10 gigabit. And I've got a little layer three switch, which is the, kind of the core of the network. And then that branches out to a little PoE switch that does CCTV. And then that feeds to just an unmanaged layer two switch, which has all the home network stuff connected to it. And all those are on a separate VLAN. So I've got separate VLANs for the home network, the CCTV, management VLANs. The WAN is on a VLAN. The modem is a Virgin Media super hub and the WAN connection on that is connected to a VLAN on my layer three switch, which means that it can be routed across any of the three servers, which how is how I get that high availability failover and live migration between the machines because the WAN is virtual. So venturing out of the local subnet, we've got two more machines. I've got a VPS cloud instance and I've got an offsite backup. The Cloud VPS is some special source here because, don't tell anyone, but I'm actually running this off a residential connection, but none of the traffic is coming out of my residential connection. So what I have is a WireGuard set up between the Cloud VPS and my PF Sense box. So all the traffic from my home lab is routed through this VPS and exits in a data center somewhere. So that means I get a static IP, I'm not blacklisted on any block lists. It's also running HA proxy. So I've got services running on my LAN that I don't want available to the public, but I still want SSL and HTTPS on those services. So I've got two HA proxy instances. I've got the one in my home lab and I've got the one on the cloud VPS. The one on the cloud VPS is only configured to terminate a set number of host names that I define the things that I want to be public. And I've also configured that HA proxy instance with Quick, which is HTTP over UDP instead of TCP, which is really good for high latency connections. So I know that between the cloud VPS and my home lab, I've got a solid connection. It's a cabled connection. The ping time is pretty consistent and it's pretty good. But the clients who are connecting to my websites and services, they might be on the mobile data, they might be on the other side of the world and the latency might be 50 milliseconds, it might be 100 milliseconds, it might be more. This is where Quick really excels because UDP doesn't need a handshake, it just sends packets. Um, it doesn't have to wait for a handshake every single time. So you can just fire off packets and it's really good and it helps things load much faster on high latency connections. If you got this far, I'm impressed and thank you. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, yeah, peace. If you're watching this and you're an employer, please hire me. I have been doing this with the intention of finding a job in IT, in infrastructure, platform, system architecture, and I hope I can convey how interested I am. And that's kind of where I've been making this video, is to, to say, hey, look, this is, what, this is what I do. I don't just have a cloud certification. I've got hands-on experience of actually making this stuff work, and I think that's really valuable, you know? And I can tell you, yes, you need to be running your Kubernetes pods with cluster IPs so that you bypass, bypass the load, port, load balancer and then your latencies will be better. But I can also tell you that your actual Kubernetes nodes have to be running confined within NUMA nodes, and you need to have memory interleaving disabled but home snoop enabled to get better throughput on your quick path interconnects. Stuff like that, stuff that m people don't think about if they're just certified on the cloud.